On the 18th of November, at 7.02am Central Time, the Starship's Super Heavy Stack lifted off from SpaceX's launch site facility at Starbase in Boca Chica, Texas in Starship's second-ever integrated flight test. This video will provide you with an overview of the launch profile and analysis of its failures, and then we'll go over the aftermath of the Stage 0 launch pad from the aerial views we captured at 10,500 feet on today's post-launch flyover, which occurred just two hours after the launch. At T-5 seconds, the steel flame deflector deluge under the OLM reached the high pressure necessary prior to ignition, spraying up to 132,000 gallons of water in all directions to protect the steel underneath. Just five seconds later, at T-0, 33 Raptor engines would ignite in rapid succession from the centre to the outside ring. At T plus four seconds after throttling up, we witnessed the stack's first movement under the power of roughly 16.5 million pounds of thrust. Seen again in this incredible drone footage by SpaceX, it's impressive to see the intensity of the shockwaves produced by 33 engines underneath the booster. You may notice that despite the full 33 engine lineup, Starship immediately began to pitch away from the launch tower. Speculation is SpaceX could be intentionally performing this manoeuvre as a way to get the vehicle away from the pad as quickly as possible. If the vehicle were to experience a failure at this stage of flight, it could crash back down to the pad and cause a catastrophic amount of damage, along with lengthy delays to future flights. This can be especially seen in the uneven charring of the orbital launch ring. We'll move back to these aftermath photos later, but for now, back to the launch analysis. As seen in this video, the full stack wasted no time getting off the orbital launch mount, especially when compared to IFT-1. This is what was supposed to happen during IFT-1, but multiple engines failing to ignite resulted in a lower thrust to weight ratio. IFT-2 also featured a faster ignition sequence with only 4 seconds passing prior to first movement. But it is here, in this shot, shown at T plus 33 seconds, that we see the first problem in flight. Zooming into Ship 25's heat shield, we noticed that a non-insignificant amount of heat shield tiles had fallen off, with more still falling during the shot. This was not a phenomenon we saw during IFT-1, at least not to this scale. We can also notice that a majority of these missing tiles are at the weld seams between two different sections, due to the tiles at these weld seams not being secured by pins, but instead by glue. However, it's worth noting that the tile issue is not a huge cause for concern. Notably, work has never tested S25 tiles with a suction device, but this testing was indeed done for Ship 28. Overall, it doesn't seem like Ship 25s were a major concern for SpaceX, but rather they were content with collecting data from the ship as is. At 1 minute and 7 seconds into the launch of IFT-2, just seconds after going supersonic, the milestone of Max-Q was called out at Mission Control, indicating peak aerodynamic stress on the vehicle as a combination of increasing in velocity and altitude. Another issue can be seen at this point, which also has to do with the ship. It appears to be leaking liquid oxygen from the quick disconnect. The same issue occurred with Ship 24 during its launch, and this is thought to be an issue with the connection of the Starship's quick disconnect arm to the launch tower improperly sealing the QD during retraction, and evidently the problem has not yet been fixed. From this point in time up until 2 minutes and 43 seconds, the flight continued nominally, or as nominal as possible with a leak in the ship. In the meantime, let's use this as an opportunity to compare the status of IFT-1 versus IFT-2. At 2 minutes and 25 seconds, right before the spinning had started on IFT-1, five engines had gone out on Booster 7 and the stack was travelling at a velocity of over 2,000 km per hour at 29 km in altitude. Booster 9, however, was travelling nearly 4,800 km per hour at an altitude of 55 km, a result of having 33 healthy Raptor engines. At 2 minutes and 42 seconds, the milestone of BECO, or Booster Engine Cutoff, was called out. Did you catch that? The two rings of Raptor engines on the booster cut off in stages symmetrically in a beautiful pattern as seen in this slow motion clip, leaving just the three inner engines lit and throttled down, SES-1 or ship engine startup 1 occurred 6 seconds later at 2 minutes and 48 seconds while the booster was still firing. This manoeuvre is called hot staging, which enables the ship to be under constant acceleration while minimising gravity losses and increasing payload to low earth orbit. 
We can see through the ship's plume deflecting off the hot staging ring that there was a smaller plume at first, followed by a larger one, indicating the sea level raptors of S-25 lit slightly later compared to the larger vacuum engines. This is necessary to put some distance between the sea level engines and the dome of the hot staging ring. Immediately following hot staging, Booster 9 started a dramatic flip manoeuvre as Launch Control made the callout for boost back startup, which is supposed to be the centre 13 engines. This was not meant to be, however, as four of these engines shut off by the third minute of flight. In the next 20 seconds, the remaining nine engines would also shut down prematurely. One theory regarding the engine shutdowns is propellant slosh. Inertial forces created by the quick rotation may have pushed the propellant to one side of the booster. This potentially creates an air pocket that starved the engines, resulting in premature shutdown or catastrophic failure. This is purely speculation on our part. What do you think was the primary cause of the engine shutting down? Let me know what you think in the comments. With separation complete and all six engines running nominally, S-25 made its way to space and had its eyes set on Hawaii. Just after T plus seven minutes into flight, however, another potential issue would pop up. An anomalous plume could be observed emanating from the ship. This was much akin to the jellyfish effect observed with twilight launches, but the timing for this observation doesn't fit that profile. The plume would be visible for the next 40 seconds before disappearing. At approximately T plus eight minutes and five seconds, all six engines appeared to shut down on the ship at a velocity of 24,123 kilometers per hour and an altitude of 148 kilometers. This shutdown came approximately 30 seconds prior to the planned shutdown, leaving the ship short of the desired parking location for the coast phase. This was followed shortly by a large plume and apparently loss of telemetry, indicating the vehicle may have been destroyed. Did S-25 run out of propellant due to a leak, or were the engines to blame? Again, let me know what you think in the comments. Not long after the flight ended, video surfaced on X revealing potential debris from S-25 re-entering over the Atlantic Ocean north of Puerto Rico. This coincides with a map of the debris field identified by the NOAA weather radar. A debris field in the Gulf of Mexico for B-9 following its FTS detonation was also present, thanks to the orbital police officer Jonathan McDowell on X for posting these. Check out this still image captured using predictive tracking by YouTube channel Astronomy Live from the Florida Keys. Your eyes do not deceive you. That is the nose cone of S25, complete with the forward flaps following breakup. Be sure to check out their channel and be on the lookout for more content on X by following at AstroFerg. So how did the launch site handle IFT2? This was the question on everyone's mind once the excitement of successful flights wore off. This is what the launch site looked like just a few hours after the launch. Immediately it's clear the launch site fared far better following IFT2 than it did following the first flight test. Aside from small debris strewn about, there are no large chunks of concrete, fondag or rebar visible. If we move in for a closer look of the launch pad itself, we see just how well the new flame deflector plate performed in this first test against 33 engines at or just below full throttle. Aside from the expected charring of the concrete and fondag, the painted locations on the OLM and the base of the tower, everything appears to be intact still. That shielding on the side of the drawwork shed attached to the tower certainly fared better this time around. A stark contrast to a similar photo following IFT-1 to be sure. Here's another comparison from directly above the launch pad following IFT-2 versus IFT-1. Some minor damage can be seen on the wall in front of the tank farm expansion area. It's possible this damage and most of the other visible damage was due to shock waves emanating from the plume as the stack lifted off the pad. The vent cap above this LOX cryo shell was likely rattled loose and slid to the edge, but didn't fall off. As we zoom out and look across the site, very little has changed, which should give SpaceX plenty of time to fix the minor damage and prepare for future vehicles to arrive at the site. The most visible damage to GSE equipment on the pad is up on the SQD arm. It appears one of the actuators holding the extension arm in place decided to give up, causing the arm to lean to one side. Taking a close look at the OLM and surrounding Fondag, no chunks can be seen missing but the cracks that have been seen in the past are more prominent. All clamps inside the OLM appear to be retracted properly and no shielding is missing from this angle. The BQD hood is crispy, but appears to have held up without much issue. 
Looking at the steel plate through the OLM, you can see the 20 engine pattern of the outer ring even better post-flight with the charring that occurred. Time will tell how much material, if any, was ablated from the plate. Overall, IFT-2 was a resounding success for SpaceX and space flight as a whole. SpaceX was able to collect an abundance of data from most of the power descent profile of both the booster and ship, while leaving behind a launch pad that shouldn't take months to repair this time. The ship reached space for the first time ever, while the booster successfully lit and maintained 33 healthy Raptor engines through stage separation. Hot staging was a remarkable success despite being the most feared stage of this flight. A mishap investigation will now be completed by SpaceX under the supervision of the FAA before resumption of flights can take place. But all signs from this launch point toward a much shorter timeline between launches than the last. Now we wait to find out what the next stack combination is for IFT-3. We hope you enjoyed this recap of the second integrated flight test of Starship from Starbase Texas. Thank you to all our subscribers, Patreon members and viewers across the globe who enable us to do what we do. We look forward to Flight 3 already and hope you'll be there to join us. I'm Jeff A from RGV Aerial Photography. See you next time.